you kind of just end up creating this money snowball that keeps rolling downhill and getting bigger and bigger and bigger on its own. You kind of create your own bank. Welcome to Supply and Demand with Adam Nadler. This is a podcast dedicated to the real estate market in Canada, available now on YouTube, Apple Music, and Spotify. Jor David, welcome back to Supply and Demand. Again, even though the first time there were corrupted files and we couldn't actually post it. So thanks for um, having faith. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, I actually have like a super big bone to pick with your entire industry. Okay. Just a heads up. Tell me. So Jor David is a financial advisor. You sell things like life insurance. You help people with their investments, all kinds of stuff like this. Anytime I speak to somebody who is with insurance, um, who is, for example, a lawyer, I, I won't even have lawyers on anymore because I start kind of like asking them about like, oh, what about this? What about that? And then it's, I guess, a very Canadian thing where the answer is always, well, it depends, you know, because like this or that could happen. And, and it's just like the it depends answer has like basically driven me up the wall to the point where I... I will never have an, another lawyer sitting here again, ever. I'm like, I'm done with it. Right. The answer is always, it depends. What can the viewer grasp from that? What can they take away from it? And the answer is nothing, right? And the, their answer is always, well, just, just they just got to speak to somebody. They got to come speak to me. They got to whatever, right? And right. that's not very helpful. So I've decided when you were coming in here today, I was like, I'm not going to ask him about all this stuff. Because just like, What's it going to be? You know, I, I was actually more curious of just like about you as an individual because you're a pretty cool dude. Thanks. And uh, yeah, like you have, if I remember correctly, your like origin story in your career is somewhat of a Batman story, if I'm not mistaken. Was it not? A little bit. I mean, I didn't know anything about anything about my industry. I thought a mutual fund was something you do with friends in high school. Like I literally didn't know anything about insurance or investing or saving. I was very lucky to have a father, like an old school father to say, listen, whatever you earn, take a little bit and just put it away. And so that was ingrained in me. And thank God I was taught, you know, very, very good skills to not get into too, too much debt and also save for the future. But I wasn't taught the fundamentals of how to invest and how to properly protect yourself and really put a proper financial plan together. And then I got into this industry and I started learning this whole other world and it's done me very, very good. So I'm very thankful for it. I'm always very interested in what you do because, and people like yourself do, because there's just so little transparency into exactly what your world is. Whenever somebody is, let's say, working with me, buying real estate, <clears throat> which is also not just a home, it's a financial investment as well. Um, there's complete transparency into the marketplace. They can just go online and see everything that's available and get full transparency on the information of exactly what products out there and what the options are for them. With your industry, there's like a zero transparency. There's not on an online database that you can just go and kind of research and compare or anything like that. So how does somebody actually figure out what to do? Well, it depends. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is to do a little bit of research on your own because you're right. There is there's a lot of information out there, but there's also very little information and it depends where you're looking and who you're talking to. So you asked, you know, what do I do? Essentially, what I do for my clients is I take a look at their whole life picture and not just financially, but also personally. What are their goals? What do they look like today? And what are their goals in two years and five years and 10 years and ultimately, you know, for life. And then I take a snapshot of them today and I put a holistic plan for them together to say, okay, this is what you're going to achieve in two years and five years and 10 years, like I mentioned. But because people's life changes, the, the, the theory I use is like real estate. I'm going to build you a custom made financial house. But over the years, what do you do with the house? You renovate it. So there's going to be changes that you're going to make to your financial house because you're going to earn more money. 
you're going to get married, you're going to have kids, you're going to want to retire, and then ultimately, we're all going to die one day. It's one of the only guarantees in life, death and taxes. And so what happens when we finally get to the end of the road? What happens to our family? What kind of legacy are we going to leave behind? So that a lot of the information that people will find on the internet is, how do I invest, right? How can I make the most amount of money quickly? But people tend to forget why they're investing. Are they investing to just make a lot of money because it's the cool thing to do? Or are they investing for a particular goal? And so what I do with my clients is I put goals together, right? Short-term and long-term goals. And I say, when do you want to retire? And how much do you want to retire with? And now they have a number in mind to say, I want to retire with X amount of dollars. And they say, great. Then this is what you have to put away based on what you have and you don't have. The foundation part of it is, what happens if you cannot earn money anymore? What happens if money stops coming in because of an injury, a sickness, a death, or the inability to earn an income? What do you do then? What's the plan? And so there's, there's different aspects of their financial house that I take a look at. Debt, debt is like rampant right now, all over North America. So how do we help people, number one, stay out of debt? Bad debt I'm talking about, like fiat debt. And then how do we help people get out of debt in the most quickest and efficient manner they can possible? And so as a financial advisor, and I can only speak for myself and the agents that I train, I take a look at all of that and I say, okay, let's put the building blocks in place so that we can guide you down the yellow brick road to financial success. That's what I do. What other advisors do at institutions, I can't speak for. I guess in terms of the yellow brick road, I mean, coming from the other side of being a consumer, I don't really see it as a yellow brick road, man. I see it more as a minefield. Okay. You know, people are looking at a safe haven in this market. They're looking for places where they just, it's not even about winning anymore. It's just, where do I not lose? Mm. Right? People were pretty confident in the bond market. I mean, but that's been all over the place and it's not exactly a 100% safe bet. Nothing is. Real estate isn't. Nothing is. Mm. So when I come to you and I say, well, it's not really yellow brick road. It's a minefield. What do you say to that? How, how do you kind of com uh, compartmentalize all of it into just like, Hey, just invest in the S&P and, you know, and you'll do well when the S&P is even mostly made up of seven companies that are generating most of, of those gains, the vast majority, in fact, of those gains. And I think it's, you know, Alphabet, and Apple and, you know, Amazon, yep. right? How do you then go and and look at that and say, well, no, if, if you would actually just direct your attention slightly over here, you're going to see yellow brick road. How, right. how do you do that? So it's a great question. The main question I get from um, investors or clients that have absolutely no idea what they're doing is their main concern is drawer. I don't want to lose money, right? That's their main concern. What if I lose all my money? Are you insinuating I have no idea what I'm doing? Not at all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, go on. But just like real estate, it always goes up. The market will always go up. Why? Because we consume. We consume and consume and consume. And prices go up and there's always inflation. The average inflation rate is, you know, 2% uh, uh, for Canada. It's really high right now, fine, but it will go back down. We continue to consume. We continue to grow. We continue to want to buy things stuff and things, right? Whether it be groceries, whether it be clothes, or whether it be electronics. I mean, you see the lines when a new Apple product comes out, there are lines upon lines. I can guarantee you that a vast, a big percentage of those people probably shouldn't be lining up to buy the next best thing because they don't have the funds to do it because they're not saving and not protecting themselves. In saying that, you know, there's this this whole you know, disclaimer that advisors will tell you historical returns are not indicative of future returns. However, when you look at the market as a whole, 
even over the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 20 years, 30 years, and you and I are young guys, we're in our 30s, we have a long time to invest until we really need that pot to live off of. When you look at the market in real estate, it's always gone up. It's always gone up. The problem with the average investor is that they chase returns. They try to make the million dollars right now, and it just doesn't work that way. I mean, look at Warren Buffett, right? Like the guy is in his 90s now, and he's still investing aggressively. And people don't realize that it is a long-term game. And I, and, and I use this with everyone, and I know it sounds you know very boring, but making money is boring. It's very you know monotonous, it's very repetitive, but that's the ultimate goal. You'll be very, very, you know, uh, um, it's very rare that someone will actually, you know, strike gold one time on a random stock that they think is going to hit, but it's a long-term game. And so it's not time, it's not about timing the market, it's about time in the market. Now, going back to the minefield of investing, the beauty of working with an advisor like myself is I have the flashlight. I have the tools to say, okay, there's a mine there, there's a mine there, don't go there. And a lot of my clients come to me and say, drawer, should I do this? Drawer, should I do that? And I say, you can, you can try, or I've actually tried it myself and I don't suggest doing it, but you can do whatever you want. My rule of thumb for my clients is as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing for your future, everything else is just bonus. So you're, I guess, going back to the consumer um, economy that we have where people are using credit card debt to buy the latest and greatest iPhone even though they don't have the money. That's right. You're saying that we should be counting on that, that that will continue and that's what's actually going to feed your investments if you just stay put in the market and not check to see if you're a millionaire every five seconds. Absolutely. You, you hit the nail on the head. Just don't look at your investments. There's been research that's been done by several different financial institutions and they found that the funds, and all a fund is, as you know, is just a clump of stocks. Some of the bigger stocks that most people um, know about, but they don't actually know they're invested in it. And they found that the orphan funds have actually made the most amount of money, right? So funds that have just been built and left without buying and trading and selling and moving around, they have actually the best returns out of the investments where you're kind of playing around. My motto with people's money, my client's money and my money is like a bar of soap. The more you play with the bar of soap, the more it dwindles away, doesn't it? That's exactly how I handle my client's money. I don't chase returns. I let the fund managers within the investments that I put them in do their work because that's what they're paid to do. And I just leave it as is. And I let the market do its work. And I may not get the highest returns, but I'm also not going to lose long term. I'm not going to lose my client's money. So I guess the age old saying of the best portfolios are the portfolios of dead men. Absolutely. That that's essentially what you're saying people should be doing and just playing the long game. Yep. But drawer. I want to be Dan Balzerian now. I don't want I don't want to wait that or how long do I have to wait to become that Dan Balzerian? I I did read The Wealthy Barber and all these other finance books and to be honest I love them. Yeah. And I'm very much, you know, an advocate of things like real estate, not that I think in the short term it's going to go up. I don't think it will, but but okay. in the long term it will as it always has. Yeah, here anyways, right. it will because we we have massive immigration things like that. Of course, eventually rates will come down. Eventually. However, when we have government spending pushing up inflation, which then pushes up interest rates, and people start playing with the bar of soap, going to GICs, going to wherever they can find a safe haven where they can find some predictability. Do you think that that is something where you're saying people should be at least getting ahead of a curve 
when there might be some volatility in the market up ahead there is a bumpy road coming up this is not going to be a smooth yellow brick road the mortar has started to collapse on some spots so i'm not telling my clients that they're going to um, get out of this um, scary time unfazed 100 percent, there are going to be losses and i tell all my clients especially the younger ones there are going to be ups and there's going to be downs however what people tend to only look at is average returns of a stock or of a fund and little do they realize average returns if you are dollar cost averaging meaning if you are continuously buying on a weekly bi-weekly or monthly basis on a continual basis if you're continuing to invest a hundred dollars a thousand dollars whatever it is average returns mean absolutely nothing and a lot of people are like what are you talking about Average returns, if you are dollar cost averaging over the long term, mean zilch. Because the mentality of people is, oh my God, what if the market goes down? I get excited when the market goes down. Do you know why? Because that means there's a sale happening. What do I mean by that? Because for the same dollar that I'm investing on a monthly basis, when there is a down market, or negative returns as people like to see them that's my opportunity to buy more of what i'm investing in and so there's a neat little you know um, exercise that i do with my clients where i show them that investing over three months at a hundred dollars a month you know even if that particular stock or that fund goes down in share price the average return means nothing because you're buying at a sale price and i'll just give you a quick example right you grocery shop what's a staple item that you buy that's either freezable or non-perishable i don't know let's say tuna yeah today can, actually canned tuna canned sure. tuna my father had a conversation with me this morning okay he says uh Jordan, do you eat tuna and i said yeah i said why because tuna's on sale so a can of tuna i asked him is how much dad he says 240 i said okay how much is it now he says a dollar so if you buy tuna, and let's just call it, for, you know, for simplicity's sake, at $2, and you buy two cans a week, but it goes down to $1, what are you going to do? You're going to buy more because you can hold that. It's not going to go anywhere. So for the same price that you're, the, the, the same money that you're spending on a can of tuna, you're buying double now. And that's exactly what a down market is. That's all a down market is. For most people, it's just the opportunity to buy more of what you're investing in. And when that share price goes back up and we do see those positive average returns, you will have come out owning more than what you did before. And so your realized return will be higher than your average return. And this is what people don't understand. And this is what I'll say it, most advisors don't teach their clients and this is why clients are so afraid of the markets and this is why they pull their money out when there's a down market and then they try to put it back in when there's an up market, which is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. So you're, for all intents and purposes, a TradFi guy. You're a traditional finance guy. I mean, if you want to call me that, then... Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're a TradFi guy. There is a... I guess a new kind of uh, you know storm come into the TradFi world with now these Bitcoin spot ETFs that are coming up from BlackRock, Grayscale, and you know these are huge money managers. These are going to be part of portfolios. Are you? How do you feel about that? Because that is something that I know you've always kind of been like, well, I don't know, you know, and 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 I've always been kind of, well, Jor, you should look at this. It's it's pretty cool, man, you know, and trying to explain it as much as I, I possibly can. Uh, but now it's coming to the TradFi world in the form of a spot ETF. So what what do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about a percentage of portfolio al allocation to having some exposure to that market i like to invest <laughs> in what's made people money in the past so it has a track record 
Now, you know, I, I plead ignorance. I don't know enough about that world, so I can't speak to it. It's not what I put my clients in. Have I dabbled with a couple hundred bucks and, you know, Bitcoins and ETFs and stuff like that before? Of course. But like I said before, it's because my future plans are taken care of already and I can gamble a little bit. And I don't even know what's in those investments because I haven't looked at it because I'm trying to use the same methodology that I use with my clients. Put it in, leave it. Don't try to buy and sell and move because you're trying to chase returns. So I don't even know if I remember the password to, to my account. Um, am I saying it's a bad thing? No, I just like to use the old traditional method of making money in the market because it's worked for many, many, many people before, right? Now it is changing times and I probably should read up a little bit more about it to see if there's an opportunity. However, I'm doing great so far and I'm on track to meet my short-term and long-term goals right now. So why mess with a good thing? Well, exactly. Why fix it if it's not broken, right? Um, I don't see this, the market as a whole going anywhere. Like I said, I mean, all these big, big companies are probably going to be around for a while. Apple and Google and Alphabet, right? Um, and the great thing about these fund managers that people don't realize is if for whatever reason, one of these companies is going to go down, the fund manager just plucks it out, gets rid of it and replaces it with another stock within the fund. And then that's it. And then everything is just status quo. Aren't you a little worried of human error with these actively managed funds? I mean, when you're dealing with a fund manager that's been doing it for 30 years, not to say that they're perfect, but machines make errors too. But I'd rather a person that I can actually talk to and meet, and I've met a lot of these fund managers and they're brilliant. I'd rather meet with the person and say, hey, what's happening here? Because they can also fix the errors too. With a machine, it's a little bit harder. Right, if it's making a mistake, then it takes a person figuring out that it's making a mistake. It won't realize on its own always. Right. Having said that, I do talk. I, I had someone on the podcast who also sells life insurance. He is also a fi, uh, financial advisor. Mm. Uh, Adam Neiman, Nyman, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Super smart guy. really like him. He was really going off about the black box in life insurance. And every time I speak to somebody else about it, they seem to think it's really not that big a deal. What are your thoughts on this? Because this, this seems to be coming up a little more, at least in my feed. Maybe it just makes good content. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? On the black box of a particular product or life insurance in general? On the black box within uh, whole life policies right. that are not universal life. Universal life, right. So No, it's not universal it's life. It's not universal life. Right. So whole life is a little bit of a black box. Now in saying that, if you want to know, the, the, the biggest thing that people don't know that is the black box inside life insurance is what is my cost of insurance? Wait, so hold on. Can you just explain what the black box is for viewers who may not actually know what it is? Sure. So whole life insurance is known to be whole life participating insurance where you get to participate in the dividends of the company essentially right? Um, it's a, called a black box because we don't know how much of our money is going towards the insurance and how much of our money is going towards the investments. That's what the black box is. However, if you want to actually know, if you want to talk to the actuaries and find out, okay, what's my cost of insurance, they can tell you it's not going to be a secret. You just have to seek out the people that actually build the product to find out Okay, what's my cost of insurance and how much is going towards my investments? Why, why is it a black box? Why don't they just tell people? It's a great question. I don't know. Maybe because there's not enough lines in the illustration to show. Whereas in a universal life policy, you know exactly what your cost of insurance is and then every other dollar beyond, it's called the target premium, goes towards your insurance. And I can see that, right? Why they don't put it inside the whole life policy, I don't know. Do you find it to be a little bit shady, unethical? I mean, call it not at all. Well. Not at all. Because Why? the life insurance industry has been around for so long, a couple hundred years. Actually, people don't know this. Like back in the 1800s, there was a, a, a life insurance company. Um, and life insurance, contrary to popular belief, has done so much for so many people, whether they're still alive and utilizing their policies or whether they've passed away and left a legacy behind to their families. 
it's done so much and I have a policy, I have a couple policies on myself and I do truly, truly believe in it. So it seems like you're just really about the, hey, we don't know what the future holds. We can only kind of determine based on what's happened in the past. These seem to be tried and true. Let's just go with that and not drive ourselves crazy about things and just kind of like move about our daily lives and just let the market do the work, let the insurance companies do the work. Now, it's not to say don't go and do your own research. I didn't say that. Obviously, get interested. Um, but the, the one model I have, and I've actually heard this from uh, one of my fund managers, is I've never met a rich pessimist. I've never met someone that has a lot of money that is skeptical and pessimistic about insurance and investing and all that stuff. And they, they just leave their money under their mattress, right? Because a lot of people do that due to things that have happened in the industry before. In Canada, we're very lucky that we have a lot of regulation. Um, there's all these organizations and associations and uh, um, um, that are protecting us from above, from what just happened in the United States with a couple of financial institutions. So I feel very safe, very, very safe. And in the, in the life insurance industry, um, there's something actually called an MCCSR number, or you might know it as a solvency ratio for every insurance company. For whatever reason, if the insurance company is going to go down, there's another company that's going to come and eat them up. And so I'm not afraid of anything happening to insurance companies, and I'm not afraid of the products and services they offer. I'm well, very confident in them. A lot of people, I guess, look at life insurance and think that, hey, this is for the death benefit. This is, if I die, my family's going to get this much money. I mean, the more I learn about what these policies actually can do, the more I learn about the fact that, I mean, if you're really being smart about it, you're using that policy way before you die, mm. if you're smart about it, and that there are massive benefits to it, financially speaking, that the extremely wealthy people of our society use, and they utilize it. They, they use it as a hard financial asset, similar to real estate in a way. Explain that because that is something that most people just have no clue about. Most people have no idea. Most people think that life insurance is just purely death benefit. Well, so there's two words that you use there, life insurance and death benefit. If it was just for when you died, it would be called death insurance. Hey, you want to buy some death insurance so that when you die, your beneficiaries can get the death benefit. But there's a reason why it's called life insurance. And I'm talking about, you know, permanent policies, right? And I might, I'll use it, piss some people off from a particular company that don't actually believe in permanent policies. And it's funny because I had a conversation with one of them a couple weeks ago and they believe that permanent policies should not exist anywhere in the industry. And that all the material that I've studied and all the literature that exists over the last couple of hundred years should be burned. And I said to him the same thing that you just mentioned. Why is it that the ultra wealthy and the financial institutions like the banks are the ones utilizing these policies as a tax shelter? And he couldn't explain it to me because he only knows one product and that's term and that's it. I think you can guess which company that is, but I don't want to badmouth anyone. Um, but to go back to, you know, your, your, your inquiry on, you know, what can people do and how can it be utilized? I'm sorry that I'm using this term, but it depends on the client situation. I, I accept your apology. You're okay. Thank you. Go, go on. So, so permanent policies are not for everyone. Permanent policies, like you mentioned, are for only a particular type of client, right? Um, if you've, you know, taken advantage of all of your RSP room, all of your TFSA room, all of your now FHSA room, what is the next best tax shelter? It's a permanent policy because of that cash value portion that will also grow for you like it does in your TFSA, like it does in your RSP. Now it's tax sheltered, it's not tax free. When you're talking about a business owner, one of the biggest things for business owners is what is my liability when I pass away? because they have big liabilities. 
bricks and mortar and the equipment that they use and all that stuff, there is a tax liability on their terminal tax return. And if there is money owing on inside their estate, or they want to preserve everything that they've built for their families to pass on, life insurance is the way to do it. But they can utilize it while they're still alive. As a successful business owner, for example, if you have a lot of what's called retained earnings, what do you do with that money in the most tax efficient way? And a participating life insurance policy or universal life insurance policy can be a fantastic option for you to utilize that money within your corporation. I only found out about this, I mean, I would say two, three years ago mm -hmm. when I was getting, um, I was buying my condo and right before closing, the mortgage broker called me up and said, hey, would you like to purchase mortgage insurance? Mm. Um, and I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, should anything happen to you where you get sick, you get cancer, you something happens, you can't work anymore, um, your insurance, your mortgage insurance would kick in and wipe out your insurance, your mortgage completely, and you would have no more mortgage to pay. And I said, well, hang on a second, let me call my insurance A team and see if this makes sense for me. I'll call you back in five minutes. I called up my sister, who, by the way, if you're buying any kind of home auto, especially she deals with high net worth individuals and she's fantastic. Call my sister, Alana Korstein. Um, Witness. Yeah, she, she's great. Um, I called her up and asked her about it and her words exactly to me were, don't touch it with a 60 foot pole. And I said, why not? And she said, because it's a regressive policy, the longer you pay into it, the less you get because the longer you're paying into your mortgage, the less mortgage there is. Mm -hmm. So when you do actually collect on it, if something were to happen to you, you'd actually, you'd get less. She said, what you should do is be looking into a progressive policy where the more you pay into it, the more you get. And that's kind of what sent me down this rabbit hole about progressive policies, which is life insurance in some sense. Then I started to learn about how the super wealthy do it and I couldn't find this anywhere online. The fact is that they don't really, this is not advertised. Things like an IFA are not advertised. Mm. And if you could just take a second and explain to people what is an IFA, because that, when I learned about that, I was blown away. That's like super interesting. So essentially an IFA, it stands for immediate financing arrangement. And I don't want to get into too much detail because I could go on for hours. You know, we've talked about this many times, but an IFA is um, only for uh, very high net worth individuals where essentially the mechanism is you buy a permanent life insurance policy. Um, most of the time an IFA is done with a whole life participating policy. You need a minimum annual premium amount of let's say $50,000. And then once that policy is in force, you can then go and take a loan with a lender against the policy. And now you have two pieces of wealth that can be growing for you. You have your cash value that is growing within the policy. And now you just got a loan in, the, in an equal amount of the premium that you can use to do whatever you want. And what you're saying to the lender is you say, look, I have this policy and if I die, this loan will be paid off and anything in excess of the loan that is left in the policy will pay my beneficiaries. So you leverage the policy death benefit at what, ratio, at what loan to value ratio? It can go up to 100%. And that's where my head exploded because in real estate, which is also a hard financial asset, most A lenders will only give you an 80-20 loan to value ratio, right? Right. They won't even let you leverage the full thing. But with a life insurance policy, a participating life insurance policy, I should say, you can leverage one at a 100 LTV, which is wild. Yeah. I mean, that's only with a participating life insurance policy. With a universal life insurance policy, you won't get 100%. You might get 60% if you're lucky. So if rates are low, and you can get, you know, a, a pretty good rate on the loan of of that collateralized policy. You can then arbitrage 
that uh, the investments made with the loan. So let's say you take a life insurance policy, you have a high premium on it, right? Which keeps pumping the cash value over time. So you are paying into it, but then that policy is growing on its own, but you've also taken a loan out. Let's say the loan is at, you know, I mean, gosh, today, these days, it's like, you know, you're lucky if you get 5%, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that's like amazing. And then you go and buy, let's say something simple, like a real estate investment trust. Let's say you go and buy RealCan, right? RealCan is giving out disbursements, not dividends, disbursements that are 100% tax deferred mm. that can be anywhere from 7 to 8%. So those disbursements are now 100% tax deferred, can then arbitrage against the interest rate of the loan, and you've got X amount left over, which can then go to feed more of the policy through premium. And that would just bump up the cash value even more. So through an IFA with a whole life policy, you kind of just end up creating this money snowball that keeps rolling downhill and getting bigger and bigger and bigger on its own. You kind of create your own bank. Yeah. And that's what Adam Nyman was kind of like, like reeling against. Yeah. I would, I'd actually love to have both of you guys in here sure, and kind of like talk about it. Cause he is, was, was super, I don't know if he was against it. He was just saying that, you know, the whole be your own bank concept that there was a lot of issues with it and people were kind of, it was glorified too much and misunderstood. But the more I look into it, I understand what he's where he's coming from with the whole black box thing of just, you know, you're basing your whole financial agreement with yourself on the black box of something that you can never know. I mean, I get it that that doesn't make so much sense in in the scope of transparency. But like you said worked out for a lot of really really wealthy people who are really really smart and that's why they're that wealthy yep so there seems to be the case where no matter how thin you slice the turkey cold cut there's still two sides to it yeah i'd love to have would you be interested in, in doing that yeah, yeah absolutely and and my argument you know to to adam and this other person that i was talking to from this other company is I said, do you really think that these very wealthy people that are smarter than you, me, you know, everyone combined, do you think that if permanent policies were not a good product or strategy, do you really think that they would buy them? Because they're very smart people. They would find out very quickly and our industry wouldn't exist, essentially. Those permanent products wouldn't exist if they weren't good, but they are good. And financial institutions, big publicly traded financial institutions, are utilizing them with the excess cash flow that they have. It's a very, it's a public thing, and these high net worth individuals and and business owners they are utilizing it. So if they're doing it, like you said, well, there's got to be something good in it, or else they wouldn't be using it. And that's why that was my bone to pick that I have with your whole industry, is that. It is so veiled. It is so, there's just so little transparency mm. into what it is that you guys do. Maybe by design. I don't know. But I know that at some level, you're kind of on your own to like figure it out. Because like I have to talk to how many different advisors to try to get at the truth of what I think it may be. And even then, I'm taking a guess. You know, there, there's something not right about that. And um I really hope that people in your industry kind of like wake up to, to, to these problems from the consumer's perspective, because frankly speaking, whenever I interact with the insurance industry, and I'm not saying you in particular, but just the insurance industry, it seems to be just archaic. Like you just, the whole industry is just Neanderthals. Like you're in the stone ages, you know? And uh, the fact that, I got you on here and you're like the first guy that w has been able to like avoid the word depends except for a couple times that I noticed here and you did apologize for it. And I thank you for that. <laughs> you're um, it's it, it does create these barriers. There, there are barriers where, you know, 
the people in your own industry are scared to even say anything. Even when I had Adam Nyman in here, he was saying, look, I'm even scared to mention this stuff because I sell the products of the insurance companies. You know, ask who you can't question and I'll tell you who your master is, right? And he was the first person to say that here. And I appreciated that and I understood it. What I don't understand is why the, the, I guess, financial vehicle itself is so cloak and dagger, why it's so veiled, how it took me so much digging. And I'm the type of guy that goes down rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. I do that. Mm -hmm. I am a very curious cat. That's just who I am. It took me so many different meetings with so many different people to weed out you know, what, what the heck is going on? And even now I'm still a little bit kind of confused. So why do you think that is? How do you think your industry as a whole gets past that? So, um, you mentioned that at the beginning of the interview that I am, uh, I'm a salesperson. I sell insurance. Most people think I sell insurance. That's not what I do. I'm not a salesperson. I'm a share person. I share information with my clients. And I ask them questions when I'm building their financial house. If something happens to you, what would you like to happen to your family? What kind of life would you want your family to have if you get sick, if you get hurt, if you pass away? Well, obviously they'd like to maintain the same lifestyle that they've built for themselves. Most people would, right? That's where insurance can come in. It's so not you, about build, you build if then, uh, you know, logic trees based on the needs and the wants of the client, I come with a solution. But I need, I ask a lot of questions before I come with a solution. The problem with the industry, Adam, is that most people come in with a preconceived idea of what they're going to sell. Why? It's a very lucrative industry that we're in. You can make a lot of money very, very quickly by just selling a bunch of products learning how to be a very good insurance salesperson, which is what exists mostly out there in my industry, unfortunately, go sell a bunch of insurance and make a crap ton of money. That's the problem with the industry. Why is there a problem? I believe there's not enough regulation. Not enough regulation. There's not enough regulation. There is not enough protection for the consumer from the average salesperson going in and just selling insurance. That's the problem. Wow, those are strong words because I've talked to lots of different people. I know people who are gung-ho on Universal and that's the only thing that they'll sell and they're kind of like, well, this doesn't, you know. I've talked to people who are saying, well, it's not just that, but you gotta also consider this. And then I've, uh, I've, I've tried my best to learn about what they're even trying to communicate to me because they're so, you know, in their own box that they can't see the forest from the trees, I guess you could say. Right. They don't understand that most people are walking in off the street and are just trying to get through, you know, getting the kids ready for, for bed and stuff like this and don't have the extra hours to put into you know, everything and are just looking to, for Christ's sake, get, get a little more space for their family. And it's easy to look on realtor.ca and just see what's available. It's not so easy to look for what it is that you guys actually provide. Right. And why do you think it is that there is no transparency as to the different products that are available? Is it, is it simply that the insurance companies do not want to have the centralization or a communicative central database for consumers as to what different products are offered by what different insurance insurance companies like insurance companies themselves along with brokerages simply just don't want to cooperate with one another do you think that that's part of it i think it's just um a lot of insurance companies starting from the publicly traded insurance companies um wanting to just appease their shareholders they have to appease their shareholders whereas you have mutual companies um, that are not publicly traded, that don't have anybody to appease. The people that they have to appease is the consumer. It's the, it's the client at the end of the day. In saying that, however, because there are so many different financial advisors out there that are licensed to sell insurance, 
there's a huge gap in training. Um, and there's, you know, two companies in particular that, again, I'm not going to mention, but their training protocols, uh, there's a lot of holes in them. And the person at the top, I mean, they want to make money. So what are they going to do? They're going to train their agents to sell the most lucrative product out there, which is life insurance. And that's the problem in the industry. And some of those companies have recently been sanctioned. Um, unfortunately, another good company has also been kind of thrown into the mix, um, but came out, you know, Scott clean because they do run an incredible, uh, um, incredible business where they actually teach and mentor and train their agents to do the proper job for the consumer. And that's why they're one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing financial services company in North America right now. Who are you guys regulated by right now? Uh, so there's regulation per province and then there's also federal regulation. No, per, per province. Per province. I mean, in Ontario, it's FISRA. In British Columbia, it's ICBC. Um, in Saskatchewan, it's ICS, right? Um However, uh, with, without you know getting too controversial, um, a lot of these, actually all of these organizations are funded by new advisor fees that are coming into the industry. It's kind of the same way in real estate. I've always thought that that was a problem yeah. because it, it doesn't make sense for the people who are being, it's, it's not good when the organizations that are regulating are bought and paid for by the people that they're regulating. It's a big, big problem. And I see that in right across the board in almost every single industry right. that is a professional industry. Right. Um, the only industry I think that th that's pretty good about it is from what I can tell after speaking to lots of people and also uh, the fact that I just have so many different lawyers in my family um, is the law society. I mean, they're really, really strict with their, with their people. Yep. Um, however, in real estate, it's in Ontario anyways, it's Rico, which has just been, you know, given a slap on the wrist to people for doing some pretty terrible stuff for decades now. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess this is probably the same thing in your industry as well. And the same thing in the mortgage industry as well. Um, I, I think it's just probably a little less common in your industry because the the barrier to actually purchasing the products that you guys have is one of, um, let's call it luxury financial products as opposed to real estate, which everybody needs a place to live. So you're going to see a lot more rampant kind of, you know, nefarious behavior, mortgage fraud, all kinds of stuff, right? Because everybody needs a place to live. People are desperate, families are pressured, bad decisions are made. Whereas when people approach you for these types of products, I'm sure that they usually already own real estate. They usually already have something set up for them where they're now looking to build on top of those foundations. Mm. And these luxury financial products end up being the you know focus of, of their attention. Um, at least that's how it happened with me like I said, through purchasing real estate, which seemed to me the be the obvious first step. Mm. Maybe I'm biased because I'm a realtor. Sure, that's possible as well. But in fact, it's it's likely. But I I kind of really am hoping that, that there is some kind of overhaul in the insurance world because I think it's desperately needed. And that's why I'm glad you came here and I really wanted to talk to you about it. Unfortunately... I do have to cut it <laughs> right here or else I'm just going to have a terrible time uh, editing this. But I'd like to get you in here with Adam Nyman and maybe do, I've never even done a three-way podcast, but it'd be pretty cool. We'll see. It's first for everything. Um, if you're down for it, are you, you open to that? Yeah, absolutely. Cool, man. Absolutely. Drawer, thanks for coming in, man. We will speak again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.